The more sustainable companies that I interview, the more I realize just how much petroleum products have infiltrated into almost every industry. And an industry that I had never thought of before was in hardwood flooring because they're using petroleum products to, to make the floor water resistant, not to even mention vinyl, which is just basically plastic. And not only that, but this hardwood flooring is coming from hardwood trees that are being cut down and deforestation has become a very massive issue in terms of the ecosystems where these trees are cut down. Not only that, but these trees are also carbon deposits as well. So impacting climate change on a major scale. However, my guest today, Greg Wilson, will be talking about his sustainable hardwood alternative hemp wood. There's no petroleum products, no deforestation, because they're just harvesting from hemp. And they don't have to cut down the entire plant to be able to produce their hardwood products, making this sustainable. So make sure you stick around to hear about the sustainable option when it comes to hardwoods. And it's not just for flooring, but so much more. So make sure you stay tuned for this entire amazing episode. Greg, do you mind telling us about Hempwood and what you guys do? Yeah, sure. So my name is Greg Wilson. I'm here in Murray, Kentucky, where we are the only manufacturers of Hempwood in the world. So Hempwood is something new, different, and a little bit strange. Every time people hear about it, they say, wow, that's cool. What is it? And so that tells us that 99% of America and higher percentage in the world don't know or haven't heard of Hempwood. And so we have to go out and preach the gospel every day to everyone who calls in. And remember that like, it's the first time somebody's heard about it. So even though it's the same story to us, it's brand new and exciting and just has that kind of the first day of school opportunity with everybody. And so Hempwood is a carbon negative product that is 100% made in America. It is more durable than your domestic hardwoods like hickory, oak, or walnut. And it has no VOCs because we developed a plant-based glue to replace formaldehyde, which is traditionally in your engineered wood product. And now vinyl is the new kid on the block for flooring, which is where we compete mainly. And vinyl's got a bunch of dirty chemicals, even dirtier than formaldehyde that people tend to not talk about because it's waterproof and cheap. So Hempwood is the only carbon negative hardwood solution out there. It's because we make our own thermal energy from our waste right here at the plant. And we have hydroelectric that comes in to do our electricity. So we're here in Murray, Kentucky. We're in coordination with Murray State University, Hudson School of Ag. And that's where most of our higher quality tech employees come from, whether it's from the ag school or from the engineering school, things like that. Most of our team is very young, like you would see in Silicon Valley, with the exception of myself now being 40. A lot of our plant managers are in their mid-20s. Our marketing team is headed by Alyssa, and she just graduated last May. And so you can see that the youthful kind of rigor that it takes to run a tech startup is running around here in the form of ag tech instead of software that you find in California. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. And you said, you mentioned that you're using a different kind of glue instead of formaldehyde. What is that exactly? Can you go into that more? I'm curious. Yeah, sure. So actually I'll start to explain the process a little bit and the glue is on the front end of that. So we take hemp stalks that grow in three to four months and pull carbon at the fastest rate of any land-based plant. Now I can say that seaweeds and things like that in the water actually pull carbon at a faster rate from my understanding, but most plants pull according to the Fibonacci sequence, 162% of what the biomass of the plant is, how much carbon it took pulling from the air to grow that. And that's why our company is called Fibonacci. It's not actually hemp wood, that's just the product. So we grow this hemp locally here, it's either grown by us or at the school or by our contracted farmers all within 100 miles of the plant of the factory here. Then it comes in, we break open the cell structure of it and we impregnate it with proteins from soy flour. And the soy flour is actually leftover soy flour that doesn't need food grade after they press the oil out of the seeds. So once you press your oils out, then you grind it up and make flour. And we steal those proteins to reinforce the cell wall of the hemp herd, which is the woody core of the hemp plant. And then the fiber is still longitudinally intact 
with that woody core, giving it the strength from the hemp fiber that everybody knows is in rope and canvas sacks and things like that that's super strong. So you get your strength from the fiber, you get your woody products or your kind of wood feel and look from the core, which is similar to balsa wood, but it's reinforced the cell walls just like a tree is growing over 200 years. A tropical hardwood is super hard, super dense. We're making our product more dense by that soy protein to reinforce the walls there. So it's a bridge. Once we soak it in this adhesive that's based out of soy and it's got some organic acid and some dish detergent in there to keep the mold and insects out, then we dry it in our dryers that were actually converted from being a rail car into taking the guts from five tobacco barns the radiators and the fans, hooking that up to our bio burner, which turns our waste hemp into heat, which heats a fluid, goes through these radiators and is used for drying out our hemp with the soy protein glue in it. Similar to what you do with tobacco when you're curing tobacco, but we do it with hemp with protein in it. Then once that's dried out, to 15% moisture content or less, we press it into logs. And once we press it into those logs in this 3000 ton press that we have right here in front of us, then those logs are loaded into an oven that used to be an old shipping container that also has some of these radiators from tobacco barns. Obviously we're in tobacco country, so you can see we're grabbing what's around us everywhere here and sticking it together. We then fuel the heat for that oven as well by our waste. So we have bio waste thermal, that's doing our ovens, kilns, dryers, and the building. And then once it comes out of that, we open it back up, we cut it into planks, and then we turn it into flooring, furniture, cabinetry, and any sort of a hardwood replacement you're looking for, whether it's architectural millworks, trims, things like that. You can see the accent wall on the wall back there is hemp in the gray and the white. The floor in here is hemp wood. There's Tommy. He was our first intern. Now he's our plant manager. Four <laughs> years later. There's tables there nice. for hemp wood. You can even see cabinets and picture frames on the wall. That's Alyssa in the background. She's in charge of our marketing. So we're doing everything that people are talking about with a carbon negative product, working towards a carbon neutral process and having zero waste because we're turning our waste hemp into our energy and selling our sawdust and our sand dust as a biofiller for hemp plastics. Fun fact is that most of your hemp plastics in the United States are being made by our sawdust or our sand dust that we send up to Michigan or Minnesota and they compound it with recycled plastic to turn into pellets. Right now they're making cannabis packaging. We would like to make Trek stepping out of it in the future. And there's my wife. I brought her over from China with me when we were doing this with bamboo. So if you've seen uh, bamboo flooring, that was my college project. Unfortunately, I have to say 21 years ago now. But hey, you've gotten a lot of experience since then. Yes, I, I just shaved my beard at New Year's because I'm getting too many gray hairs. Nice, it. nice. But that's really cool. I was about to ask, where did you, how did you come up with this process? But a lot of it was inspired by what you were doing with bamboo flooring over in China, right? Yeah. So when I was in college, I went and studied in China for a semester and did an internship at a bamboo flooring mill. And they were trying to figure out how to make bamboo flooring densified, so harder, so you could use it for commercial applications. Because bamboo is traditionally soft. And so if you were putting it in a restaurant, high heels were putting dings and dents and chairs and things. So there was this big rush or race to figure out how do you make bamboo high density, like an old growth wood. That way it can be used for flooring, furniture, cabinetry, things that need to have that durability. And we came up with a way of impregnating it with glues and then compressing it together and baking it in an oven like a loaf of bread so you can make a log out of something that used to be a bunch of little strips or fibers. And I wasn't the inventor of that process. I was early on in it where I was putting together a lot of the actual day-to-day -day standard operating procedures and wrote a math equation out of it, an algorithm that kind of took the whole process and put it in numbers. And I did get my name on some of the patents and stuff like that. And I actually lived there for 14 years making bamboo logs. Nice. And then you came back over here 14 years ago or when did that? 2018. Okay. Gotcha. So that was literally Recently, like, uh, you know, five years ago when the farm bill passed and the research on this was to a point where it made sense to actually jump into doing template. This was the thing. And when we were setting it up, we saw this whole carbon scenario that people were calling for and made in America where people were looking for a carbon negative product. Let's face it. That's a problem. When 
cars are emitting as much carbon as they are or the built industry which is concrete and wood and rebar and steel and all this are throwing so much carbon into the air you're digging it out of the earth and you're throwing it back up into the air and then expecting something not to change. And the reality is some sort of pollutants in the air cause more heat on the, the plain and simple of it. And so if you can do something that's pulling some of those pollutants, some of that carbon out of the air and sticking it back in the soil, why not? You can make a pile of money if you want to go to Wall Street, but if you want to do something right or good, you probably got to roll up your sleeves and do it. And Murray State University, when I came up with this crazy idea, we're going to make hemp wood, they said, sure, let's figure it out. And so that's how we ended up in Kentucky here. Nice. And I love that how you were mentioning like all those things that like how you built your whole process with the old shipping containers and you've used like the old uh, tobacco drying kind of like processes. You're really like taking whatever you have in your environment and just like making it a way to apply it to what you have now and to make your new hemp wood in, in this new format rather than trying to say, oh, I'm going to find all these new resources and build something completely new. You were like, how can we use what's around? I think that's like really awesome that you were able to do that. Absolutely. It's significantly necessary because America doesn't make very much anymore. So if people aren't making machines here anymore and you have to see if something actually works, when we were standing this place up, we bought the press because I was familiar with that with bamboo, but our first oven before we could take that shipping container and turn it into a 20 foot oven. We went on Facebook marketplace and we found an oven that was used for powder coating motorcycles, motorcycle frames, and went and bought that thing as our proof of concept. It was like 3000 bucks when we had to drive six hours to go pick it up. That's how we figured out, oh yeah, this is the temperature. We got to bake, bake the blocks before we set it up in a full scale oven. And then that full scale oven, we had to figure out how do we hook that up to our waste so we could have a carbon negative. And the soy-based glue was the exact same way. We were working with Oregon State University and Murray State University. Both have chemistry departments that are really good at these organic chemistries. And we figured out it worked in a lab. And then we had to figure out how to do it on a full scale. So we went to tractor supply and bought some horse troughs, like the watering troughs for horses. And we're filling it up with 100 gallons of glue at a time. And then soaking our hemp stalks in it and literally <laughs> just picking it up. And we built some racks out of wood two by fours and we're setting it out in the sun to dry to figure out <laughs> hey how does this process work and then pressing it into a log and modifying and adapting it before we then bought tobacco barns and started using those as dryers but we had them hooked up to natural gas so we had a silo dryer which used for drying silos of corn or beans hooked up to the bottom of a tobacco barn throwing in hot air to recirculate through and it worked, but it wasn't big enough and it was using natural gas, petroleum based products. And so then we said, all right, how do we do this? But using a renewable energy. And the answer was a bio burner heating fluids, which we learned from the tobacco industry because they do have wood chip burners that you can hook up to tobacco barns, but the tobacco barns were too small and not quite what we were looking for. So we had to find a rail car and then the guts from five tobacco barns shoved into one rail car. So it's continuing to develop the hemp wood process like that. Now our second facility, which is here as well, makes the finished goods, the flooring, and most of that equipment is off the shelf. You can buy most of your flooring equipment from established manufacturers, whether they're in the US or overseas. You can find a lot of that stuff from other wood mills that are shutting down or other wood mills that have additional old equipment, things like that. But you do have to modify the process because hemp wood is so hard and durable. It's got the density of a 200 year old Brazilian cherry, 20% harder than hickory. So we had to get diamond tooling to be able to cut the tongue and groove profiles. And we had to set it up on an engineered platform we learned, which is a plywood backer we use a Columbia Forestry Products, West Virginia Poplar as the backer. And it uses that same soy-based glue. They were the ones who helped us and taught us what is the minimum requirements for doing the soy-based glue. We had to obviously adapt it to our hemp wood, but we use a West Virginia, which means everything is locally sourced. We have the glue that puts it together. We cut it with a diamond tooling. And then we had to modify the coatings that we put on it because most coatings are petroleum-based and they are not as healthy as you would want them to be. And so we found the cleanest Bona coatings that you could apply. And then we did it by hand for the first two years. And then we 
just are finally starting to get that part of it mechanized too. Nice. That's really awesome. And uh, being able to just use that innovation and that spirit of just like always considering how you can you manipulate it and make it work better. And what is your hope for creating Hempwood like now in, in this marketplace? Where do you see it going? Right now, it fits best if you're going for a residential application for a healthy material because nobody wants to have dirty toxins inside of their house, whether you have children and you're worried about them getting asthma or whether you have some sort of elderly people in your house that already have respiratory issues. Nobody wants to put something dirty into your home. So that works very well for us as far as putting as a residential product. And then for commercial, it's a fire resistant, 20% harder than hickory, carbon negative product. And so all of the architect and design firms are really running wild with it because they say, this is what everybody's talking about doing. There's these crazy guys down in Kentucky that are really doing. It. And so that's our main points right now is a face grade hardwood. That's a replacement for oak, hickory, walnut, Brazilian cherry, teaks, all of those. And is a interior product. Now, in the future, we are working towards a recycled plastic with our sawdust Trek style decking for exterior, but that's a year or two down the road. We're also working towards a structural wood, what we call OHB, oriented hemp board, to be able to build structural elements of a house, potentially even some studs or LBL, but that's a 2025 market launch product. So right now we're just kind of doing what everyone's supposed to do and getting hemp wood out into the market and people like yourself that are actually preaching the good word of sustainability and healthy materials are definitely our Sherpas along the path because we lived upon that if you build it, they will come scenario. And COVID changed everybody's priorities for what they were looking towards for a couple of years. And now things are finally getting back on track and you throw a recession and a war on the other side of the world into it. And people are forgetting that like, you should just do what's right and be nice to your neighbor rather than try to exploit the country next door or try to sneak dirty chemicals into a product. And then because you can make it cheaper, there's no reason to make flooring for the United States and Cambodia which is where the majority of the flooring in the U.S. comes from now. So I do encourage everybody who's watching this or looking at this to just read the origin of where their product comes from. Because why would you cut down an oak tree in France or Ukraine to send to Cambodia to marry it up to a piece of formaldehyde glue plywood from Russia to sell in a store in California? And the reason is because you can make more money doing the wrong thing than you can doing the right thing. And the powers that be have found that out, that dollar an hour labor in poor countries allows someone in the big city trading house to make more profit off of it. And the more people realize that your local economy is what keeps things rolling, the more they'll realize that shop local, buy something made in the country that you're in, you don't have to buy something from a huge corporation because in order for those huge corporations to make the profit margins that they need to pay the stock market and to pay all of the powers that be in there, they have to cut corners, which is labor and material. And people wake up to that and say, I'd rather have a healthy material that I can go on YouTube and check out the Instagram or YouTube channels for Hempwood and see how it was made, where it was made, and who's making it, then your floor or your kitchen table has a meaning to you. It actually, you can say, hey, look, I heard the story where Tommy was an intern. Now he's the plant manager four or five years in, and he's running his team of eight or 10 guys making hemp wood every day. And you can live the story of what we're doing here rather than say, yeah, it was cheap and I bought it at Lowe's and it was made by a company like Shaw or Mohawk that had a Cambodian potentially child laborer putting it together with some dirty chemicals. And that's the reality. That's what happens. It's the same thing as like when they caught McDonald's doing the burgers that were made with animals that were rejected from your prime grade, but they were grown in South America where they cut down the rainforest because you could easily 
grow more beef down there and feed them with soy, that exposes, oh, that's how McDonald's was making their profit. That's how Lowe's and Home Depot are doing their stuff too. It's just people haven't quite caught on to, hey, if it's made in America, there's some rules. And if it's made overseas, there's an opaque kind of layer to that you don't quite know and you can't quite see. And people will go buy certifications to tell you, oh, yeah, this is healthy and clean. And they're just buying the certification. They're not going to all the extent of, yeah, we're using our waste as our energy. We're using a plant-based glue because I don't want to have a clean room in my factory where you can apply a dirty glue. Definitely. And I know you mentioned a couple of times that you're in conjunction and working with a number of the local universities and everything around your plant. What first allowed you to start collaborating with them? Or was this kind of from the beginning that you started working with them? So you always have to reach out to the universities first. So I've worked with Oregon State University since 2008 with various projects. And so I talked to Oregon State University and said, hey, I'm trying to figure out this soy-based glue that came from your campus. And I think it was about 2000, 2001, they started doing some soy-based glue research there. And so I reached out to them about the glue. And Murray State, I called Murray and said I was looking for a place that was going to have a thousand tons of hemp stalks per year. And that the internet told me Murray State planted the first hemp in the United States since it became legal in 2014. And that historically hemp had grown in this region because of the climate and the soil, some of the best in the US. And so before it was illegal, if it made sense to grow it here, then it seems like it would make sense that it's gonna grow here after it becomes legal again. And Murray State University literally answered the phone with Dean Brannon, from the ag school here. When I called him, he said, what do you do? I said, I make bamboo floor. And he's like, in China? I was like, yeah. He's like, okay. It's a Chinese number that came up on my phone. And so <laughs> that checks out. And he yeah. said, are you going to pay your farmers and pay your employees before you pay yourself? And you're welcome to come down and have a go. And so that's how we figured it out. When I showed up, he actually gave me a building on campus and said, hey, on the school farm, he's like, here's a building you can start doing some of your research at where you try to get nice. your feet underneath you for the rest of it. And that's literally led 20 plus employees here in Murray, Kentucky, just because Murray State University said, yeah, we'll have a go. Wow, that's awesome. Love that. What I would say or my ask from you and your listeners and your group, go on the website, order a sample pack. We'll credit it towards your first large scale order. It's hempwood.com. Give us a like on Instagram or TikTok or book or YouTube and just check out what we do. There's the origin story on all the different platforms. We've got videos about how we make it and tell people about it. Try to make this thing understood and known. So when someone walks into a flooring next year or the year after, they are not surprised and saying, wow, hempwood, that's cool. And then they go and buy oak or vinyl flooring. They look at it and say, hempwood, I've heard of that. That is a legitimate option for putting into my home. And they already have a little background that they know it's a clean material. They know it's made in America. They know it's durable. They know the history of being the only carbon negative, or at least hopefully by that time, other people are starting to do it. So we can just say we were the first, not the only. That's our goal is to get everybody else to step their game up. But it starts with the market and your listeners knowing and understanding what we're doing here. Yeah, definitely. For sure. And I'll have all the links down the show notes and everything like that too. And then maybe as your goals for the next six months or so. Get through this recession scenario where the winter time is always the most difficult seasonal time of the year for building materials, for building, for production. You've got weather problems. You've got daylight hour problems. You've got all of that. So kind of cruise through the first quarter, really sharpen our blade to be ready to kick down the door come the warm weather starting to come back. And we want to grow and become profitable in the second quarter of this year. We have hit gross profitability some months, but never net profitability. We want people to understand what we're doing and understand that hempwood is not just for the people that don't have to care about the price of things because now we're getting different grades of hempwood flooring where you can find some of our flooring if you need something that's more on a budget you can find some stuff at 5.99 a square foot you can get some of our common grade pre-finished at 7.99 a square foot and then you can get our premium select grade at 9.99 a square foot so it fits a lot of different tranches of people's budgets whereas maybe you don't want to put hemp wood in your entire house or in your entire building but you can put it in your home office your yoga studio your wine cellar or an accent wall in your house where it can be a piece of something that kind of reminds you that 
I did make the choice for the healthy, sustainable material. Even if it's just an accident like that behind the wall there, things only three foot by eight foot, that's 24 square feet. You can do that for a couple hundred bucks. And every day you look at it and you say, some people look in the mirror and say, oh, hey, I'm ready to go take the world on. You can wake up every day and look at your accent wall and say, you know what? That puts me in a good mood because I made the right decision. Yeah, definitely. You made a choice to buy a sustainable product that was made in America and is carbon negative, which is great. It's not like you went out and made an accent wall that was just another oak or something like that. It's something that you can remind yourself of how you made the sustainable choice, which is really awesome for sure. 100%. And you get it. Yeah, definitely. And I'd love to ask this question too. What are you currently learning right now? What am I currently learning? The biggest takeaway from 2022 that is a hard pill to swallow is that no matter how good of a job you do, no matter how clean of a product you do, money dictates the majority of decisions, unfortunately. And so even if somebody wants to make the correct choice in a building material they're going to put somewhere, at the end of the day, what they can afford is what they actually choose to do. And so it's up to us as a manufacturer to come up with maybe not a cheaper product quality wise, but different grades of product like you do in the wood industry where you have a select grade and you have a common grade and you have a rustic grade and allow people to make their own decision on what they can afford or what they want to do rather than just saying, hey, one size fit all. You have to give the option. Yeah, definitely. It's good. And where do you see being able to reduce prices in the future as you're able to scale further or what's holding your product back from being more cost competitive? We are directly competitive, even cheaper than domestic hardwood. But when people say, oh, it's not competitive. Well, that's not the case anymore. We've, we've brought our costs down by about 20% every year since we started. So three years in a row. We've reduced our price to our customers by 20%. We do expect that to continue for this coming year. I don't know how to pull it off the following year. I guess we'll see when we get there. So what we have to do is just make sure people are comparing apples to apples. So for domestic hardwood flooring, we are at cost parity in some cases even less. But if you're comparing us to flooring that's made overseas, then we are not as cheap as. If you're comparing us to vinyl, that's a completely different product range. So for domestic hardwood, yep, we've got it. But as far as a made in a lower cost country or made with a cheaper base material like vinyl you're comparing apples to oranges definitely it's just like you're not even comparing the same product they don't have the same features they don't have the same durability they don't have any of that it's different products for sure absolutely so yeah fantastic one last question here if anybody wants to follow you reach out to you how can they best get in touch absolutely hempwood.com and if you go on there you can get a hold of us via our chat app You can get a hold of us at sales at hempwood.com. You can fill out some of the different inquiry forms on there, whether it's for flooring or general questions. You can get a hold of us on Instagram, which is hempwood underscore. You can get us on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook, or even on Pinterest. So it's all over the place. Just look up Hempwood and all roads lead to Rome. Great. Thank you so much, Greg. It's been awesome talking to you about Hempwood and how you're a sustainable product. So Thank you so much. And I hope to have you back on sometime so we can check up and see how you guys are going. Absolutely. Thanks, bud. (laughs) And if you enjoyed this interview with Greg Wilson from Hempwood and how they have created sustainable flooring and hardwood products that is price competitive with any hardwood on the market while being sustainable and not using petroleum products, then I invite you to check out Sheets and Giggles. They have some of the softest, most sustainable bedding in the world with their eucalyptus sheets, mattresses, and all their other giggles. So if you would like to check out another product that is disrupting another industry by being so much more sustainable, then definitely make sure you check out this interview with Sheets and Giggles.